the National Security Act of 1947, July 26, 1947, to promote the national security by providing for a Secretary of Defense, for a national military establishment, for a Department of the Army, a Department of the Navy, and a Department of the Air Force, and for the coordination of the activities of the national military establishment with other departments and agencies of the government concerned with national security be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled. This act may be cited as the National Security Act of 1947. Declaration of Policy Section 2 In enacting this legislation, it is the intent of Congress to provide a comprehensive program for the future security of the United States Incorporated to provide for the establishment of integrated policies and procedures for the departments, agencies, and functions of the government relating to the national security, to provide three military departments for their operation and administration of the Army, the Navy, including Naval Aviation and the United States Incorporated Marine Corps, and the Air Force, with their assigned combat and service components, to provide for the authoritative coordination and unified direction under civilian control, but not to merge them, to provide for the effective strategic direction of the armed forces and for the operation under unified control and for their integration into an efficient team of land, naval, and air forces. Title I, Coordination for National Security, the National Security Council, Section 101. There is hereby established a council to be known as the National Security Council, here and after in this section referred to as the Council. The President of the United States shall preside over meetings of the Council, provided that in his absence he may designate a member of the Council to preside in his place. The function of the Council shall be to advise the President with respect to the integration of domestic, foreign, and military policies relating to the national security so as to enable the military services and other departments and agencies of the government to cooperate more effectively in matters involving the national security. Council shall be composed of the President, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, appointed under Section 202, the Secretary of the Army, referred to in Section 205, the Secretary of Navy, the Secretary of Air Force, appointed under Section 207, and the Chairman of National Security Resource Board, appointed under Section 103, and such of the following named officers as the President may designate from time to time. The Secretaries of the Executive Departments, the Chairman of the Munitions Board, appointed under Section 213, and the Chairman of the Research and Development Board, appointed under Section 214. But no such additional member shall be designated until the office. Advice and consent of the Senate has been given to the appointment to the office the holding of which authorizes his designation as a member of the Council. In addition to performing such other function as the President may direct for the purpose of more effectively and coordinating the policies and functions of the de Department and agencies of the government relating to the national security, it shall, subject to the direction of the President, be the duty of the Council to 1. to assess and appraise the objectives commitments, and risks of the United States Incorporated in relation to our actual and potential military power in the interests of national security for the purpose of making recommendations to the President in connection therewith, and two, to consider policies on matters of common interest to the departments and agencies of the government concerned with the national security, and to make recommendations to the President in connection therewith. The Council shall have a staff to be headed by a civilian executive secretary who shall be appointed by the President and who shall receive compensation at a rate of $10,000 a year. The executive secretary subject to the direction of the Council is hereby authorized subject to the Civil Service Laws and the Classification Act of 1923 as amended to appoint and fix the compensation of such personnel as may be necessary to perform such duties as may be prescribed by the Council in connection with the performance performance of its functions. The Council shall from time to time make such recommendations and such other reports to the President as it deems appropriate or as the President may require. The Central Intelligence Agency or CIA Section 102 A. 
There is hereby established under the National Security Council a Central Intelligence Agency with a Director of Central Intelligence who shall be the head thereof. The Director shall be appointed by the President by and with the advice and consent of the Senate from among the commissioned officers of the armed services or from among individuals in civilian life. From the Guardian.com, Underwear Barmer was working for the CIA. Bomber involved in plot to attack U.S. bound jet was working as an informer with Saudi intelligence and the CIA. It has emerged. Scared you, didn't it? And this was not according to state security, which would be you. This is according to national security policy maintained by Congress. They are putting you into fear so that they can protect you, but they're the ones preying on you. National security applies to corporate policy. It's a corporation. A foreign nation is not a sovereign state. 28 U.S.C. subsection 1603. For the purposes of this chapter, a foreign state, except as used in section 1608 of this title, includes a political subdivision of a foreign state or an agency or instrumentality of a foreign state as defined in subsection B. B. An agency or instrumentality of a foreign state means any entity which is a separate legal person corporate or otherwise, and two, which is an organ of a foreign state or political subdivision thereof, or a majority of whose shares or other ownership interests is owned by a foreign state or political subdivision thereof, and three, which is neither a citizen of a state of the United States as defined in section 1332 C and E of this title, nor created under the laws of any third country. The United States Incorporated includes all territory and waters, continental or insular subject to the jurisdiction of the United States Incorporated. D. A commercial activity means either a regular course of commercial conduct or a particular commercial transaction or act. The commercial character of an activity shall be determined by reference to the nature of the course of conduct or particular transaction or, or act rather than by reference to its purpose. A commercial activity carried on in the United States incorporated by a foreign state means commercial activity carried on by such state and having substantial contact with the United States incorporated. From Amateur 2D Bills and Notes 1. Definitions Nature of Commercial Paper Subsection 1. Generally Bills and notes in their various forms are contracts and may be negotiable or non-negotiable. Bills and notes are commonly defined as commercial paper or negotiable or non-negotiable instruments. 2. An internal commercial paper. Commercial paper is commonly defined as negotiable instruments, drafts, checks, certificates of deposits, and promissory notes. Commercial paper is governed by provisions in, of Article 3 of the Uniform Commercial Code. Subsection 2. Contractual nature of negotiable instruments. Bills and notes are in modern terminology drafts, checks, notes, and certificates of deposits or contracts. Accordingly, the fundamental rules governing contract law are applicable to the determination of the legal questions which arise over such instruments. An instrument may be negotiable, and while not removed from the law relating to contracts, such an instrument constitutes a commercial specialty. A negotiable instrument is distinguished from an ordinary contract by incidents having their foundation in the law merchant, which in most jurisdictions has been in large part codified by statute, first in the Uniform Negotiable Instruments Acts and subsequently in the Uniform Commercial Code. Subsection 3. Generally, the law merchant. The law merchant is the law which confers negotiability on commercial paper and governs negotiable instruments. More specifically, it is the pre-statutory or non-statutory law which govern bills of exchange, promissory notes, and namely the lex mercatoria or the custom of merchants. Subsection 4. Uniform Negotiable Instruments Act. The Uniform Commercial Code supplanted the Uniform Negotiable Instrument Act, which was promulgated in 1896 as the first uniform law by the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws and was in force in all of the states of the United States until superseded. The act was largely a codification of the rules 
of the law merchant or the common law rules relating to negotiable instruments which previously were enforced in effect by virtue of judicial pronouncement or legislative enactment. Its purpose was to establish for certain fixed rules governing negotiable instruments and to bring about a uniform system of laws on the subject and thereby do away with the confusion that had existed in the law of commercial paper. The Uniform Commercial Code, Subsection 5. The Uniform Commercial Code has been enacted, at least in part, by every state in the United States Incorporated and by the District of Columbia and the Virgin Islands. The Uniform Commercial Code is arranged in 10 articles. Article 1 contains general provisions, Article 10 is the effective date and repealer article, and Articles 2 through 9 are each concerned with a particular type of commercial activity. The code as a whole is known and may be cited as the Uniform Commercial Code. The Uniform Commercial Code as proposed by its sponsors, the American Law Institute and the National Conference of Commissioners on Uniform State Laws is accompanied by extensive comments explanatory of and correlating the various code provisions. From Black's Law 8th edition, Jerry Justionis, by way of doing business. A nation's acts that are essentially commercial or private in contrast to its public or governmental acts. Under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, a foreign country's immunity is limited to claims involving its public acts. The statutory immunity does not extend to claims arising from the private or commercial acts of a foreign state. 28 U.S.C.A. subsection 1605. See commercial activity exception restrictive principle of sovereign immunity. Jury and Perry. Jury and Perry is by right of sovereignty. The public acts that a nation undertakes as a sovereign state for which the sovereign is usually immune from suit or liability in a foreign country. Again, see the restrictive principle of sovereign immunity. The restrictive principle of sovereign immunity. The doctrine by which a foreign nation's immunity does not apply to claims arising from the nation's private or commercial acts, but protects the nation only from claims arising from its public functions. Uniform Commercial Code is just a conglomeration of private and commercial acts. You just saw it in Amger itself. What the hell are we consenting to this stuff for? The United States Incorporated is a corporation. They're only adhering and acting as to acts of commerce and private acts, which disallow immunity or any amount of sovereignty. You are the United States lowercase and you are with full sovereignty and immunity, you only adhere to the public law, meaning do no harm. So we went into depth on the 1947 National Security Act, and we need to go further along on the timeline to see the fallout of this, or the expected result, the predetermined outcome. On April 24, 1974, Dr. Henry Kissinger proposed in his memorandum to the National Security Council that depopulation should be the highest priority of United States incorporated foreign policy towards the third world. He quoted reasons of national security and because the U.S. economy will require large and increasing amounts of minerals from abroad, especially from less developed countries. Wherever a lessening of population can increase its prospects for such stability, population policy becomes relevant to resources, supplies, and to the economic interests of the United States Incorporated. This is what launched the depopulation program. The targeting agency for the operation is the National Security Council's ad hoc group on population policy. Its policy planning group as in the U.S. State Department's Office of Population Affairs established in 75 by Henry Kissinger. The OPA, or Office of Population Affairs, is actually the United States Department of Health and Human Services. OPA is a leader in family planning and reproductive health care services training and research. Okay. Now this all began as eugenics or genocide, but now it's soft sold to you as family planning because it sounds nicer. From blackgenocide.com, dot org, sorry. At a March 1925 international birth control gathering in New York City, a speaker warned of the menace posed by the black and yellow peril. 
The man was not a Nazi or Klansman. He was Dr. S. Adolphus Knopf, a member of Margaret Sanger's American Birth Control League, ABCL, which along with other groups eventually became known as Planned Parenthood. I'm going to make you pause here because you need to realize this is 1925, well before Hitler. Now during this time, corporations were just taking a heavy, heavy burden of all of these populaces and all of these human beings and the overhead was really really great and so such as Bear Corporation came in in 1927 July 26 1927 to ask the World Courts which is maintained by Congress to indemnify Poland it had nothing to do with racism it was corporate overhead that they wanted to cut there's a permanent link here www.worldcourts.com PCIJ slash ENG slash decisions slash 1927.07.26 space chores out C H O R Z O W dot H T M. The citation is factory at chores out in parentheses Germany versus Poland 1927 PCIG series A number 9. July 26. So what is really the US Department of Health and Servi Human Services? It's a eugenics program. So when you're seeing this from Russia Today, for example, NSA bugged UN headquarters in a report, that's to throw you off because what's actually occurring is information. You're applying for welfare. You're applying for Social Security. You're applying for licensing and titles. And what this is, is that is the National Security Pro Program. You are the underwriter underwriting policy. You are guaranteeing these revenue streams through the insurance schematic, subject to their laws, because you're still claiming to be a citizen of this corporation. You can only be a product of a corporation. All right, and here's an example of corporate policy gone awry from the LATimes.com. Rival campers who opened fire turn out to be sheriff's deputies. Feuding LA County deputies, both off duty at Prado Regional Park, apparently didn't know they were colleagues, and they didn't realize that they weren't shooting at or around citizens. And now they're apologetic because they were shoot shooting at each other. However, what about citizens? They have a directive to uh, off citizens. An apparent booze filled dispute over loud music between two group groups at a Chino campground over the weekend escalated to the point where men from both sides drew guns and opened fire. No one was hurt, but the two alleged gunmen had plenty to explain. It turns out that the rival gun toting campers were both Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputies. Authorities suspect the off-duty co cops learned they were colleagues only after their campground showdown. Absolutely. It's okay to, to do that to citizens, but it's not okay to do that to each other, right? This is sick. What the hell is everybody still doing consenting to this stuff? And an update on the veteran uh, that was deployed during the time that his child was being adopted out by the state. Um, from the TulsaWorld.com, adoptive parents visit baby Veronica, but future visits being challenged. Now here's the scary part. A GAL is normally a pedophile. In a flurry of activity that came Friday at the Cherokee County Courthouse, the Capabiancos appeared to be objecting to the appointment of a guardian ad litem to represent their adoptive daughter's best interest during the court proceedings. A gag order remains in effect and the court records are sealed, making few details available other than the court docket which gives only a brief description of the orders and motions. Judge Wells signed a writ of habeas corpus that brought the cop Biancos and Veronica's biological family together for a three-hour hearing August 16th. She also imposed the gag order, preventing the public from knowing much about what happened at the hearing. Now, gag orders protect pedophiles. It stops the public from seeing what's going on behind the scenes, and we need to do something about this. If you don't stand up, who protects us? The predator? The state's just racking in that revenue. They're generating revenue off of the baby, off of the adoptive parents, off of the biological parents that are fighting this. 
Everybody needs to keep their eyes open and watch what's going on. This is human trafficking. Congress is soft selling its drone use. From Reuters.com, archaeologists use drones in Peru to map and protect sites. So they're soft selling this, this eugenics program as a scientific based research program. Again, from Reuters.com, Canon spies opportunity in surveillance as camera growth cools. So as they're losing business on one side, Canon's drumming it up on the other by entering into this surveillance program opportunity. Pretty sure it's time to boycott Canon and its uh, programming. Now this guy was killed by cops to protect him from killing himself. From the Guardian.com, man dies after police taser incident. Man in Plymouth was doused in a flammable liquid when police were called out to investigate a domestic disper disturbance. A man has died after suffering horrific burns in an incident when he was tasered by a police officer while doused in a flammable liquid. Police were called to the home of 32-year-old Andrew Pl Pimlot in Plymouth following a domestic disturbance and told that he was in the garden and had a can of flammable liquid with him. An officer discharged a taser and according to eyewitnesses, Pimlot was seen fully on fire from top to bottom. One of the officers jumped on him to try to put out the flames. So they lit him on fire to protect him from himself. I think they're pretty nice, aren't they, according to national policy? Here's a lesson for everybody. A report from WRDW.com. Sister of a man who died in taser incident works in law enforcement. Now this guy flagged down police to help him and ended up dying at their hands. He's the one that called them out to help him. Stop calling them out to help you. They are privateers, they're business licensed privateers. Their function is to kill you or drag you in front of Admiralty Courts for condemnation and sale. This is all maintained by the Board of Commissioners or Corporate Council. They know who's who, they know what your value is. If there's value in putting you in an institution or in a prison or through the medical or psychological industry, you'll go there. If there's no value in it and you're better off dead, and more uh, efficient according to death derivatives, they're going to kill you. From IntelliHub.com Police tase man for trying to rescue his baby from fire. Baby does not make it. They stopped him from saving that child. And now a child is dead. Obama Martyrs mark 50th anniversary of civil rights turning point from CNN.com Commemorating the long fight toward racial equality that many say hasn't ended, marchers on the National Mall on Wednesday, including President Barack Obama, commemorated the 50th anniversary of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. On that August day in 1963, when King and his fellow marchers attended what he labeled the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation, few in that crowd could have imagined that half a century later, an African-American president of the United States would mark the occasion with a speech in the same location. From supplementary detailed staff reports of intelligence activities and the rights of Americans, Book 3, final report of the Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with respect to intelligence activities, United States Senate, April 23, 1976, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Case Study, Introduction. From December 1963 until his death in 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was the target of an intensive campaign by the Federal Bureau of Investigation to neutralize him as an effective civil rights leader. In the words of the man in charge of the FBI's war against Dr. King, quote, no holds were barred. We have used similar techniques against Soviet agents. The same methods were brought home against any organization against which we were targeted. We did not differentiate. This is rough, tough business. The FBI collected information about Dr. King's plans and activities through an extensive surveillance program employing nearly every intelligence gathering technique at the Bureau's disposal. Wiretaps, which were initially approved by Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, were maintained on Dr. King's home telephone from October 1963 until mid-1965. The SCLC headquarters telephones were covered by wiretaps for an even longer period. Phones in the homes and offices of some of Dr. King's close advisors were also wiretapped. 
The FBI has acknowledged 16 occasions on which microphones were hidden in Dr. King's hotel and motel rooms in an attempt to, to obtain information about the private activities of King and his advisors were used to completely discredit them. FBI informants in the civil rights movement and reports from field offices kept the Bureau's headquarters informed of developments in the civil rights field. The FBI's presence was so intrusive that one major figure in the civil rights movement testified that his colleagues referred to themselves as members of the FBI's Golden Record Club. The FBI's formal program to discredit Dr. King with government officials began with the distribution of a monograph which the FBI realized would be regarded as a personal attack on Martin Luther King and which was subsequently described by a Justice Department official as personal diatribe, a personal attack without evidentiary support. Now remember, the Department of Justice is over the FBI, so they knew exactly what was going on. They're playing Heigl here. Congressional leaders were warned off the record about alleged dangers posed by Reverend King. Wow, does that sound familiar or what? The FBI responded to Dr. King's receipt of the Nobel Peace Prize by attempting to undermine his reception by foreign heads of state and American ambassadors in the countries that he planned to visit. When Dr. King returned to the United States, steps were taken to reduce support for a huge banquet and a special day that were being planned in his honor. Now to realize what's going on here, we have to go to the creation of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, six well-educated Confederate veterans from Pulaski, Tennessee, created the original Ku Klux Klan on December 24, 1865 during the reconstruction of the South after the Civil War. Now, the Confederacy is the federal government. That is what the FBI comes from, Federal Bureau of Investigation, stems through the federal government, the Confederacy, the criminal conspiracy. From Black's Law Dictionary, first edition, Confederacy. In criminal law, the association or banding together of two or more persons for the purpose of committing an act or furthering an enterprise which is forbidden by law or which, though lawful in itself, becomes unlawful when made the object of the confederacy. Conspiracy is a more technical term for this offense. The federal government created the KKK and racism. It tried to take out Dr. King because he was speaking out against racism and he knew what was going on and eventually they had to kill him. They had no other option. So the next time you see Gray Hitler there standing up for the rights of Americans, don't believe it. He's Gray Hitler. He's not black. He's not white. He's not Muslim. He's not Christian. He's just Gray Hitler, and nobody realizes what he's doing. National security dictates that we have to be polarized from each other in order for them to offset congressional bankruptcy by taking all of us in there into the system and using us to do so. From the Assassination Archives and Research Center. Interim report, alleged assassination plots involving foreign leaders. Part 2, covert action as a vehicle for foreign policy implementation. Covert action is activity which is meant to further the sponsoring nation's foreign policy objectives and to be concealed in order to permit that nation to plausibly deny responsibility. The National Security Act of 1947, which established the Central Intelligence Agency, did not include specific authority for covert operations. However, it created the National Security Council and gave that body authority to direct the CIA to perform such other functions and duties related to intelligence affecting the national security as the National Security Council may from time to time direct. At its first meeting in December 1947, the National Security Council issued a top secret directive granting the CIA authority to conduct covert operations. From 1955 to 1970, the basic authority for covert operations was a directive of the National Security Council's NSC 5412-2. This directive instructed the CIA to counter, reduce, and discredit international communism throughout the world in a manner consistent with the United States foreign policy, states foreign and military policies. It also directed the CIA to undertake covert operations to achieve this and and define covert operations as any covert activities related to propaganda, 
economic warfare, political action, including sabotage, demolition, and assistance to resistance movements, and all activities compatible with this directive. In 1962, the CIA's General Counsel rendered the opinions that the agency's activities were not inhibited by any limitations other than those broadly set forth in NSC 5412-2, CIA General Counsel Memorandum of uh, April 6, 1962. Now, Rick Perry is traded as the general counsel, by the way. Rick Perry is also Health and Human Services, United States Department of, listed as a corporation on Dun & Bradstreet, General Counsel Law PC, Plano, and Office of the General Counsel, Huntsville, Texas. And this is right on Dun & Bradstreet, if you go to Dun & Bradstreet, dnb.com. Now, what does this mean to you? Now, most of our listeners are probably scratching their head and wondering why I went off on to Rick Perry. Now, from Black's Law Dictionary, 8th edition, Gubernator Novice, is the pilot or steersman of a ship. The Gubernator Novice could be sued for damages if he negligently caused a collision. Judas means with law. Jesus means your earth or your vessel there and you have a pilot or steersman steering it. The etymology on ecumenical means representing the entire parentheses Christian and parentheses world formed in English as an ecclesiastical word from the late Latin oecumenicus meaning general such as the general council. So the National Security Act is actually a rule book on how to crucify Jesus again and I'll continue reading from covert action as a vehicle for foreign policy implementation in his 1962 memorandum CIA's general counsel made it clear that the CIA considered itself responsible for developing proposals and plans to implement the objectives of National Security Council 5412-2 the memorandum also stated that even in developing ideas or plans it was incumbent on the agency not only to coordinate with other executive departments and agencies, but also to obtain necessary policy approval. The committee has been faced with determining whether the CIA officials thought it was necessary to obtain express approval for assassination plans, and if so, whether such approval was in fact either sought or granted. Now, we need to stop right there and look at such as Saddam Hussein, because it was the CIA that came out and said there's weapons of mass destruction, they reported to everybody there were never any weapons of mass destruction. They only wanted to go into that country to implement such as the Federal Reserve, Fractional Reserve Banking, and use the sheeple to offset congressional bankruptcy. It's all the same game. Beginning in 1955, the responsibility for authorizing CIA covert action operations lay with a special group, a subcommittee of the National Security Council composed of the President's Assistant for National Security Affairs, the Director of Central Intelligence, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, and the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. Today this group is known as the 40 Committee and its membership has been expanded to include the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. During 1962 another National Security Council subcommittee was established to oversee co covert operations in Cuba. This subcommittee was a special group augmented. Its membership included the special group, the Attorney General, and certain other high officials. In exercising control over co covert operations, the special group was charged with considering the objectives of proposed activities, determining whether the activities would accomplish the objectives, assessing the likelihood of success, and deciding whether the activities would be proper and in the national interest. The chairman of the special group was usually responsible for determining which projects require presidential consideration and for keeping him abreast of developments. Authorization procedures, however, have not always been clear and tidy, nor have they always been followed. Prior to 1955, there were few formal procedures. Procedures from 1955 through 1963 were ch characterized in an internal CIA memorandum as, quote, somewhat cloudy and based on value judgments by the DCI. 
The existence of formal procedures for planning and implementing covert actions does not necessarily rule out the possibility that other more informal procedures might be used. The granting of authority to an executive agency to plan covert action does not preempt presidential authority to develop and mandate foreign policy. Formal procedures may be disregarded by either high administration officer, officials or officers in the CIA. In the Snyder incident, for example, President Nixon instructed CIA officials not to consult with the 40 committee or other policy-making bodies. In the plot to assassinate Castro using underworld figures, CIA officials decided not to inform the special group of their activities. One CIA operation, an aspect of which was to develop an, an assassination capability, was assigned to a senior case officer as a special task. His responsibility to develop this capability did not fall within the special group's review or covert of covert operations, even though the same officer was responsible to the special group augmented on other matters. The Central Intelligence Agency also has a formal chain of command. At the top of the structure of the CIA is the Director of Central Intelligence, or DCI. His immediate subordinate, the Deputy Director of Central Intelligence, or DDCCI. Together, they are responsible for the administration and supervision of the agency. Beneath the DCI and directly responsible to him are, four, are the four operational component, components of the agency. During the period covered by this report, the component responsible for clandestine operations was the Directorate of Plans, headed by the Deputy Director of Plans, or DDP. The Directorate of Plans was organized around re regional geographic divisions. These divisions worked with their respective overseas stations headed by the Chief of Station, or COS, in planning and implementing the direct Directorate's operations. The divisions which played a part in the events considered in this report were the Western Hemisphere Division, WHI, which was responsible for Latin America, the African Division, AF, and the Far Eastern Division, or FE. Now everybody needs to realize here, while we pause for a moment, that education is a covert operation. Education pits you and your brother against each other, teaches you culture, social beliefs, social dynamics, religious construct, and a myriad of everything else. Education itself, that is the indoctrination program to get you to go along with the system. That is a covert operation under low intensity conflict. In addition to the regional divisions, the Directorate of Plans also included three staff level units which provided some oversight and coordination of division projects. The staff units had no approval authority over the divisions. However, they could criticize and suggest modifications of projects sponsored by divisions. The three staffs were foreign intelligence, counterintelligence, and covert action. So what you see here is like tendrils or fingers coming off of an arm, basically. When functioning in accordance with stated organizational procedures, the Directorate of Plans operated under a graduated approval process. Individual projects propo project proposals generally originated either from the field stations or from the divisions and were approved at varying levels within the Directorate depending on the estimated cost and risk of, of the operation. Low cost, low risk projects could be approved at the deputy director for plans level. Extremely high cost, high risk projects required the approval of the DCI. Covert action proposals also required approval of the special group. Also within the directorate of plans was a technical services division or TSD which developed and provided technical and support material required in the execution of operations. A separate directorate, the Directorate of Support, handled financial and administrative manner, matters. The Office of Security, a component of the Directorate of Support, was largely responsible for pro providing protection for clandestine installations and, as discussed at length in the Castro study, was occasionally called on for operational assistance. Now we're down to B, the concept of plausible denial. Non-attribution attribution 
to the United States for covert, covert operations was the original and principal purpose of the so-called doctrine of plausible denial. Evidence before the committee clearly demonstrates that this concept designed to protect the United States and its operative from the consequences of disclosure has been expanded to mask decisions of the president and his senior staff members. A further consequence of the expansion of this doctrine is that so subordinates, in an effort to permit their superiors to plausibly deny operations, fail to fully inform them about those operations. Plausible denial has shaped the process for approving and evaluating covert actions. For example, the 40 Committee and its uh, predecessor, the Special Group, have served as circuit breakers for presidents, thus avoiding consideration of covert action by the Oval Office. Plausible denial can also lead to the use of euphemism and circumlocution, which are designed to allow the President and other senior officials to deny knowledge of an operation should it be disclosed. The converse may also occur. A president could communicate his desire for a sensitive operation in an indirect, circumlocutious manner. An additional possibility is that the president may, in fact, not be fully and accurately, accurately informed about a sensitive operation because he failed to receive the circumlocutious message. The evidence discussed below reveals that serious problems of assessing intent and ensuring both control and accountability may result from the use of plausible denial. Now all of this can be lo located at www.aarclibrary.org and we're going to recap a little bit here from CNN.com options bad, worse, and even worse. Analysts, uh, any choice holds risks. President Obama cites a wide range of options in dealing with Syria. Okay, here in this thing, you see John Kerry and you see President Obama up there, and they're all conversing. Remember that they're all created from the same hand. They are the same hand. They are the same arm. They're the same thing. And combined with the National Security Act, if you need to present to your sheeple that there's a bunch of terrorists, first you're going to go to the Board of Governors, who of course is John Kerry, one of the Broadcasting Board of Governors. And you're going to make up a really good story. Like Brownie over there is doing something to you. Or Blackie over there is doing something to you. Or Whitey over there is doing something to you. Or Jew, or Zionist, or Islamist, or any number of ism. Judaism, Catholicism. You're going to create some conflict there. Controversy. From Black's Law First Edition, Trover. In common law practice, the action of Trover, or Trover and conversion, is a species of action on the case and originally lay for the recovery of damages against a person who had found another's goods and wrongfully converted them to his own use. Subsequently, the allegation of the loss of the goods by the plaintiff and the finding of them by the defendant was merely fictitious and the action became the remedy for the wrongful interference with or detention of the goods of another. Now you've been found. That's what controversy is. It's with Trover, the action of with Trover. At that time, you are treasure trove. Treasure trove from Black's Law Dictionary, first edition. Literally, treasure found. Money or coin, gold, silver, plate, or bullion found hidden in the earth or other private place. The owner thereof being unknown. Unknown. You're still claiming that fiction, the last name. Nobody knows who owns you. For example, today on CNN.com, Congress will get its say on Syria. Now they're going into that country, they will bomb it, they will injure and harm everybody, and guess what happens? They get to find them. Let me show you. In the uh, Laws of War, Amelioration of the Condition of the Wounded on the Field of Battle, the Red Cross Convention of August 22nd, 1864, they set up or establish foundling hospitals to find you after they hurt you so that they can cash in on your body, on, on all of the injury that happens, on all of the harm. And that includes being born in their hospitals. 
Remember, it all goes back to the insurance. It all goes back to the international classification of diseases and disorders. It all goes back to Congress. Congress is cashing in on your demise. They want to enter into Syria. They're, they're taking out Syrian government. They do that on, on purpose because if you don't have a government, they have to take you as prisoner of war under their rules. And, of course, all of this looks really charitable. We, we listen to the news when um, they're at war with what we think is another country or another set of people, and we see the charity and the refugees saved by the UN. They're not saving them. They're the ones that harm them and then save them on the back end. It's always Heigl. It is always the Heigelian dialectic. Always, always. From Reuters.com, slow pace of justice wears down Occupy Wall Street defendants. Occupy Wall Street protesters who once vowed to occupy the courts by challenging their arrests on minor violations have since been defeated by the slow pace of justice with many foregoing trial. You know, this is the premise of all of this. They can wait you out. They're playing with your money, backed by you. They've got all the time in the world, and if you don't stand up and indict them, hold them accountable for what they're doing, it just continues. You guys get bored. You guys get tired. You take some guilty pleas for non-criminal actions. They're making money left and right, raising your estates, and nothing ever happens. You have to stand up. We'll be right back after this short break. Rocco Show, everything legal plus more. You never know what you're going to hear on the Bo and Rocco Show at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Hi, this is Bo from the Bo and Rocco Show. This week, we'll be examining what's behind this push for the war in Syria. We'll also be talking about how the military was created by the National Security Act of 1947 and the nature of our military before that time and after. We'll be answering the question, what is a surety? Here at the Bill and Rocco Show, we still maintain divesting off title, do no harm, indict those that do harm as a sovereign state under 28 U.S.C. Chapter 97. You're tuned into freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio. A message from Leaving the Farm here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Have you ever contemplated burying your head in the sand and waiting till this passes? From the New York Times.com, Victim's Dilemma. 911 calls can bring eviction. Norristown, Pennsylvania. The police had warned Lakeisha Briggs one more altercation at her, at her rented row house here. One more call to 911 and they would force her landlord to evict her. That's called criminal coercion, by the way. They could do so under the town's nuisance property ordinance, a law intended to protect neighborhoods from seriously disruptive households. Hmm. Officials, meaning banks or courts, can invoke the measure and pressure landlords to act if the police have been called to a rental home with three times within four months. What the heck? Aren't they there to protect humanity rather than corporate policy? This is corporate welfare over and over and over again. You are allowing this. And I'll read on. So she faced a fearful dilemma. Miss Briggs recalled when her vo volatile boyfriend showed up last summer fresh out of jail stint for their previous fight and demanded to move in. I had no choice but to let him stay, said Miss Briggs, 34, a certified nursing assistant. Even though she said in an interview she worried about the safety of her three-year-old daughter as well as her own. Now, he's being maintained as product of the system, too. The bank there is letting him out on cash and catch and release. The bank charged him for violations against her her, meaning she's a prostitute for the bank or the court, and the cycle goes on and on and on and on and on and on, maintaining corporal welfare. So if you're one of those people that uh, want to leave your head in the sand, please get out of our way, because you're next. You'll be the one that's evicted. You'll be the one that's target of corporate policy, and the bank will come after you. Or perhaps somebody else and charge somebody else for rent on your body after you're found dead or you're raped or abused or your children are preyed on. The bank will charge them too. It does not discriminate against color, race, religion, or whoever you are. It doesn't matter. Go ahead and bury your head in the sand. It'll cost you. And the bank will cash in. Breaking news from Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. 
as seen on the WashingtonTimes.com, Syrian rebels use sarin ga nerve gas, not Assad's regime, UN official says. Testimony from victims strongly suggests it was rebels, not the Syrian government, that used sarin nerve gas during a recent incident in the revolution Iraq nation, a senior U.S. diplomat said Monday. Carta del Ponte, a member of the UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Syria, told Swift's TV there were strong concrete suspicions, but not yet incontrovertible proof that rebels seeking to oust Syrian strongman Bashar Assad had used the nerve agent. This is not true. Let me show you. First of all, the Commission on Inquiry is from, it's a commission state through the U.S. Department of State, the U.S. Department of State. That is their program. The International Commission of Inquiry was um, pursuant to United Nations Security Council Resolution 1564 in 2004. That was the one on Darfur. Remember all that fiasco? And of course, this is all maintained through the U.S. Department of State. John, Ch John Kerry is sitting there as the secretary. He is the clearinghouse to offset congressional bankruptcy. These people are being slaughtered by the United States Incorporated in order to offset congressional bankruptcy. If you go to whitehouse.gov right now, go to the National Security Council and you will find that it is the United States Incorporated that runs this. Their function is depopulation. On April 24, 1974, Dr. Henry Kissinger proposed in his memorandum to the National Security Council that depopulation should be the highest priority of U.S. foreign policy towards the third world. He quoted reasons of national security and because the United States incorporated economy will require large and increasing amounts of minerals from abroad, especially from less developed countries. Wherever a lessening of population can increase the prospects for such stability, population policy becomes relevant to resources, supplies, and to the economic interests of the United States Incorporated. The targeting agency for the operation is the National Security Council's ad hoc group on population policy. Its policy planning group is in the U.S. State Department's Office of Population Affairs, established in 1975 by Henry Kissinger. The Office of Population Affairs can be found at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which is what that is. Low intensity conflict is the use of military forces applied selectively and with restraint to enforce compliance with policies or objectives of the political body controlling the military force. The term can be used to describe conflicts where at least one or both of the opposing parties operate along such lines. Winning hearts and minds is within that under psychological operations. Winning hearts and minds is a concept occasionally expressed in the resolution of war, insurgency, and other conflicts in which one side seeks to prevail not by the use of superior force, but by making emotional or intellectual appears to appeals to sway supporters of the other side, such as implicating welfare benefits, health and human services, medical insurance, social services, everything else. What they're doing is they're raising their country and then buying them or purchasing them by these concepts. I'll go on and read about the Malayan use. The use of the term hearts and minds to reference a method of bringing a subjugated population on side was first used during the Malayan emergency by the British who employed practices to keep the Malayans trust and reduce a tendency to side with the Chinese communists. In this case by giving medical and food aid to the Malays and indigenous tribes. The Office of Population Affairs is the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This is the appearance of charity in order to perpetrate depopulation across the globe at the hands of Congress. Which of course brings us back to the National Security Act of 1947, July 26, 1947. Title I, Coordination for National Security, Section 101, National Security Council. Section 102, Central Intelligence Agency. Section 103, the National Security Resources Board be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assembled, this act may be cited as the National Security Act of 1947. The Broadcasting Board of Governors governs all known media, all known mainstream media, rather. So basically what that story says in the mainstream media 
is that somebody else is doing this other than them. John Forbes Carey, the Secretary of State, also sits on the Broadcasting Board of Governors. This is just one big uh, bamboozle against the human populace globally, when in reality it rests at the shoulders and head of Congress. Get rid of Congress. This has been a breaking news report from Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps.